Hi, I'm Deborah Zotti, founder and CEO with Women Get On Board, and this is Women Get On Board in Conversation. Our goal with these video series is to offer women business leaders advice for their board journeys to go through thought-provoking conversations with experts. And it's our pleasure to offer insights to that will help empower and provide confidence and courage for women to lead and serve on corporate boards. Today, I'm pleased to be speaking to Elaine Roper, who's head of board CHRO practices and a partner of public sector at Audrey's. Elaine, thank you so much for joining us today. And I know we're going to talk about a very important topic that we talk about all the time is how can one position themselves to get on a corporate board? So Elaine, welcome. Well, thanks very much, Deborah. And maybe just a little bit of background, uh, additional background. So in my role at Audgers, I work with boards across all sectors of the economy, including crown corps, public companies, private companies, and not-for-profit boards. Uh, we build out inaugural boards, we've undertaken significant board renewal projects, and we've identified candidates for evergreen lists. Uh, so we also do board evaluation. We under take a variety of board uh, governance related projects, such as governance policy reviews, compensation reviews, etc. And we work with experienced board directors as their board careers evolve. And we also engage with early stage and mid stage um, director uh, executives who want to start to develop their board careers. And they may be actually at the point of retirement or sort of moving to that next phase and want to try to understand what's involved in terms of a board career. So um, I routinely meet with numerous candidates weekly. I get a lot of referrals from, from uh, clients, from candidates, from people such as yourself and, and uh, other, other women that, uh, that uh, I engage with in, our, in my network. And these candidates come from a very broad range of backgrounds and ages, professions. And consequently, I think it's fair to say that our board pool is probably one of the largest uh, in the country and, and most diverse, I would also go on to say. So as you know, I've been working with your organization and with Women GCs of Canada, uh, recently with uh, Women in Finance and other groups uh, also groups representing diverse candidates. And uh, we work generally with, uh, with uh, candidates in terms of coaching them, really helping them think through why do you want to be on a board? What, what is it you want to out of a board career? Uh, and then trying to help reinvent themselves in terms of shifting from from either a professional a senior level professional uh, or or a c-suite executive into a board director it's a different way of thinking it's a different way of operating and so we need to get them to really think about how are they going to serve in that capacity so working with women a lot of women um, and really pulling out what are their key accomplishments what are their unique skill sets so one of the things I say to all board directors is, you know, we have to get beyond managing big teams, big budgets, et cetera. And what are the unique things that you've done? Have you had an international career? You know, have you been doing a lot of M&A? You know, so really pulling out those skills that differentiate them from all the other candidates who are competing to get on a board and um, really uh present themselves in a different light. The other thing that we do through our governance workshops, which we've been running for a couple of years now, is we really try to um, prepare these candidates, and some of them are clients, um, to serve on these committees. So they may have been an executive who is the sponsor of, of a, a finance or audit committee, whatever, but we really are teaching them you know, the fundamentals. And I know, Deborah, we've worked with you. You've been wonderful in terms of serving as a subject matter expert on some of these workshops to really get them prepared to to uh, serve uh, on the board when they when they land there. So, Elaine, maybe I'd pause on that, because what, uh, as you know, uh, I've been a big champion to help facilitate and invite guests 
Um, but one thing I wanted to feedback from the individuals that have gone, they found that it's been so practical, mm -hmm. really practical, kind of what they don't teach you in Harvard Business School. But like, so what is it that you need to know as the chair or you're on an audit and finance committee? What do you need to know if you're on a governance committee? So yeah. Lane, kudos to you and your colleagues and, and the other speakers, mm -hmm. because they are really, really practical. No, thank you. And you know what? We want people to feel confident when they actually land on a board, when they land on a, a, on one of these committees. So what should they be focused on? What should what do they need to know? Uh, what are the emerging issues and, and really how do they prepare themselves for that? Um, the other thing when we're talking to candidates is we really are talking with them about saying these are serious roles. Being a board director is, is not a lark. It's, it's a significant time commitment um, and, and it takes a lot of work, A, to get onto a board. So getting out of your first board takes a lot of work, due diligence, a lot of research, a lot of networking, as, as you know, you and I have talked about many times, you know, really working your network. Who do you know? Who can help you? Who has the inside track on a particular board? Who are the board directors? Do you know anybody? Can they give you the insights about what is the board culture? How does it function? Um, how is the chair? Does, you know, is the chair an effective leader? How is the management team? So all of these things that you want to really evaluate as you're thinking about getting on a board. So I want to pause on that because that's sort of looking at the individual, getting the individual to be thinking about what's your value proposition? How do you align? What are the skills, expertise that you can bring to a board? Because it is, as you said, different than being an executive. So with that in mind, let's turn the tables and say, okay, Elaine, you're an executive recruiter and you've got a board search. So what are the things that, you know, you work with the client being the company or the organization that's looking for a board candidate and you've got this pool. So how do you marry those together? And, you know, because you're working both sides, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So to our clients, we say that we are their ambassador. And so we're trying to ensure that um, the candidates that we are bringing forward will have the skills, the competencies uh, and, and the right alignment to what that organization is. So we're validating skills and competencies and expertise, but we're looking beyond that. We're really examining potential fit, building on what was mentioned before about values. And, and we're also probing for behavioral traits, uh, fit with what we know to be the board culture. We're assessing if the candidates will be able to take on board leadership roles. So many boards say, you know, we want to hire someone now who is a, you know, a director who has, you know, uh, has a, a CPA. They can serve on the on the finance committee, but ultimately we're looking for someone who can chair the finance committee. So do they have the qualities of leadership to ultimately serve in a leadership role? on a committee and then eventually potentially as, as a vice chair or board chair. So we're looking for those kinds of things. We're also looking to ensure that candidates have the runway to serve out their terms uh, because that's really important. Um, important to note that you have to really evaluate a board to make sure that it's the right fit. But then um, most boards, if they're in the public sector or, or not-for-profit, they will have very clearly defined board terms. Typically, those are, you know, two, three-year terms or three, three-year terms, whatever. So we want to be sure that we're bringing people on board who will serve out their terms. If you're on a publicly traded company board or a private company board, that term may not be defined. But nobody is looking for someone who's going to come for a year or two, decide they don't like it and move on, or they're overboarded, which is also something that we really look for, um, making sure that um, people have the capacity to serve. The other thing that we look for are any potential conflicts of interest. Uh, so what, what, what sector are you working in professionally if you're still working? So for instance, if you're in financial services, probably will preclude you being on uh, any other uh, financial service board. Um, we also have to look at if you are retiring from a company, especially one of the financial services companies, 
there are there are term limit there are limits to um, when you can serve when you can start to serve if you're coming out of the public sector there's a five year hiatus so that you can't be in any kind of uh, a, a um, sorry I'm missing the word here. Um, Call, I, yeah, sometimes they call them sunset clauses sometimes. Yeah, something, yeah. So whether you have any of those clauses that we need to look at and be mindful of so that we don't put you forward for a board where there's a clear conflict and, and what have you. The other thing is, if you are still an executive, um, a couple of things to keep in mind. One, if you are in a C-suite role, chances are you can only do one, possibly two other boards outside, and usually they'll be not-for-profit or possibly public sector. Um, and um, if you are in transition as an executive, I always counsel candidates, land your full-time job first so that you know where you're going to be. And if there are any potential conflicts <clears throat> or, or if there's anything that we're Include you serving on a board, then we can then we can talk about boards. Because what doesn't look good is if you join a board and then you have to step off a year later, a couple of months later, because you've landed a job that's a conflict. So these are some of the things that we look for. So one other thing that I add to it, especially for finance and audit committees, and I've had this where you've got a December thirty first year end, and you've your public company, and all that reporting is kind of coming mid. February to end of February. Yeah. And if you have a multitude of boards that have the same year end and they're public companies, it's very challenging to kind of get through that period, right? And then also just knowing your conflicts, knowing the corporate calendars of your existing of existing boards with new yeah. ones, you want to make sure. And I'm sure you, you know, right away, if you're yeah. If you're reaching out to candidates, they're going to want to know the corporate calendar, right? Like, what are the Absolutely. dates? Yeah, you know? that's job one. So when we're putting together an executive brief uh, and we're talking with a client, one of the first things we ask is, what is your board schedule for the next year or two? When we put together an executive brief, which is sort of a marketing information document for candidates, we always include that board schedule. For the for at least one year and, and usually for two years, because we're trying to arm candidates with as much information to make an informed decision as they possibly can. And I have seen your briefings and they are, they are very fulsome. So I don't think there's anything missing after you've read those, but um, maybe one of the things we can turn to Elaine, and we've talked about this is, mm -hmm. you know, how, what does a board profile, like if so, mm -hmm. you know, you've got this executive briefing, you've specced out what the, the company is looking for. What's the ideal submission that a candidate should mm -hmm coming back with, whether you call it a board profile, your board documents, what what, what yeah. constitutes a board um, submission? Right. So really your board profile should highlight your unique skills, competencies, and, and really the sectors where you're going to bring the greatest value, especially when you're starting out your board career. Once you are established, you can probably transition between sectors fairly easily. Your board skills become transferable. But when you're first starting out, look at what are what are your particular expertise? And that's what I was referencing earlier, where we're going to pull out what have you done that is unique about your background? Because boards don't come to us, and I often say this, they don't come to us and say, send us a garden variety board director, no such thing. Um, they come to us and they say, we want someone with either domain expertise or a professional expertise, or right now what's really, really hot is um, cyber expertise, ESG, DEI. So really what have you done in in those realms and and where have you led and where have you um, developed a particular expertise obviously no one's going to take you on on a board just because that's all you bring because you will bring much more than that but if you have one of those particular expertise areas those are those are things you really want to highlight uh, the next thing you should include is really what board governance um, or uh, board experience have you had? So I always say, especially if you're a new exec, a new board member, you may not have prior board experience. So I always say, if you have presented to a board, if you have been the sponsor of a board committee, so you're the GC and you have served as a corporate secretary, 
highlight that. So highlight your skills on both sides of the table. If you have board experience, terrific. Outline the boards that you've been on, the roles that you have held, indicate the, the terms that you were on. And then if you led any specific initiatives, so for instance, if you were the chair of the CEO search committee, if you were the lead director on an M&A initiative, those are the things that should be highlighted. Again, in brief, we, we're not trying to write to, uh, you know, a, a book here. We're really trying to provide a very crisp, professional-looking summary. We then would have a, your section on your professional and your executive experience, again, in summary format. Um, and any very significant key accomplishments, one or two bullets, sort of on the most recent executive roles that you've held. Then you'll have a section on your education or professional development, your credentials, professional credentials, awards. If you have been doing a lot of public speaking, if you know if that can be included. Um, and then, as I mentioned, keep it professional keep it concise and highlight your key accomplishments only. When you are applying for a specific board role, you'll have a cover letter and there you can elaborate as appropriate. So that's, that's I think, what you want to do. Well, and what I would say a follow on to that is whatever you're saying in your board profile, your board resume equally should be on your LinkedIn. Yeah. Because people are going to check your LinkedIn. They're going to go and if they're two separate, I'm this and I'm not that, people are really, it's that your consistency and your credibility should, you know, line yeah, up. Absolutely. And, you know, even if you are not on Facebook or, or uh, you know, uh, on Twitter or whatever, you really should have a LinkedIn profile because oh. that is sort of the de facto professional um, social media medium. Um, and and as you just mentioned, Deborah, the very first thing anybody does is they go and look at your LinkedIn profile. So so that should be up to date and should mirror your board profile, as you mentioned. Um, but when we actually do placements uh, in terms of background checks, we'll always do a reference checks, usually with with board chairs, committee chairs, peers. Um, but we'll also do credit criminal. Um, and and credential and professional credential checks, and we always do a social media scan. So that's something. That, another thing that I always advise directors is make sure you go through, do a scan on yourself, and see what pops up, and see if there's anything that you think needs to be cleaned up. Because at a director level, more than at a at an executive or an employee level, we're really looking for people who have pretty squeaky clean credentials. And and uh, so it's really important that you present the very best profile you can. So Elaine, I know we're just going to come to wrapping up. So, you know, based on our conversations, what would be the key takeaways that you'd like our audience to leave today? Okay. Well, I would say prepare yourself to take this on. It's It's a profession or a new career and it requires different skills, considerable time, and significant effort both to launch and then to serve as a director. I would say do your homework, do your due diligence in finding the right boards to serve on, consider your interests, your expertise, and your capacity to serve, and really also consider very seriously what value you are going to add, and also evaluate the culture and your fit with any board you're considering. So I think those are really the fundamental things that I would say, you know, there's lots of other advice I give for specific roles, but I think fundamentally, I think those are the things to think about. And those are great. So where can, uh, where can people find you, the work you do? What's the best way to connect with you, Elaine? Best way to connect with me is to go through the Audgers Burnson website, um, and uh, look under people and then you'll find my profile. Uh, and uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, and so you can also find me on LinkedIn and uh, look forward to connecting with, uh, with anyone who, who has an interest and uh, really uh, welcome uh, women applying because we really do try to promote women and, and uh, get them on to get their board careers launched and, and successfully. 
Thank you, Elaine. Uh, that's it for this edition of the Women Get On Board in Conversation. Thanks so much for joining us, Elaine, and sharing your insights with our Women Get On Board community. To find out more, for more about our resources and your board journey, you can go to womengetonboard.ca. Thank you.